um, this particular tool um, right here is intended to impart um, from today's sessions, um, looking at the lens and about teaching credit reports and scores. So this instrument as they exist now are products crafted uh, by for-profit companies. So who collects and sells data to lenders and service providers and how to assess to charge and mitigate risk. Um, they aren't providing a public service. Uh, this is a for-profit system that makes money off your information, regardless of its accuracy, um, largely without your consent. Um, so the information in the reports is decontextualized for the sake of efficiency. And for marginalized communities, this lack of historical concept context assumes that all things have always been and are currently equal. And they just aren't. Um, so we'll put a link in the resources doc to an article titled uh, From Inherited Racial Bias to Incorrect Data, the Problems with Current Credit Scoring Models um, that we found helpful in understanding some of the critiques of the credit scoring system that you're seeing here as a visual representation. Um, so access to credit um, equals economic security and mobility. In an agrarian society, land and credit was essential for a farmer's survival. A typical farmer only had money when they harvested and sold their crops, but they had expenses all through the year. Their family need, needed basic essentials like food, clothing, and medicine. They also needed to buy farming equipment and supplies. So they requested a line of credit from the local merchant. Credit smoothed out their consumption and allowed them to optimize their cap the capacity to grow their income. Their basic survival was jeopardized without credit. If access to land and credit opens up opportunities to meet your basic needs and grow your assets, what was the effect of some being offered that access for centuries while others were not? For formerly enslaved people, being freed was not the same as being free. After the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, formerly enslaved people, despite being freed, were trapped into a segregated economy where they started with nothing. The promise of 40 acres and a mule was rescinded. Most formerly enslaved people who had built America's economy were forced back into oppressive conditions in a segregated society ruled by terror. They were denied access to land and excluded from access to credit. And meanwhile, in Oregon, the government is taking native land and giving it to white male settlers and up to 640 acres um, for free. And so land followed by credit grew opportunities for those that were given access. Sorry, I lost my place. Um, so as we discussed at length in the past sessions, our economy has been built to include, serve resources and validate some while excluding um, undeserving, oppressing and exploiting others. Um, so again, them versus us, deserving, not deserving, uh, which directly stifles wealth building opportunities um, in this country. So wealth cannot be built if you are stuck in low paying jobs, um, not having access to low affordability, so credit and banking, um, segregated housing, unequal education opportunities, unequal access to food and to health care. So every single one of these economic legacies that persist impact access to affordable credit, though some progress has been made to increasing access, access and making explicit segregation or exclusion illegal. These systems carry a design that was built to benefit some by excluding or underserving others. So we're going to talk a little bit about a key dominant narrative, um, which is credit scores are a neutral way of assessing credit risk. Um, an individual's action determines their score. The counter narrative of that is uh, a quote that I'm going to read from Frederick Wary. Credit scores or the data used in current credit scoring models are not neutral. It's a mirror of inequalities from the past. By using this data, we're amplifying those inequalities today. It has striking effects on people's 
life chances. Frederick Wary is, um, runs the Dignity and Debt Network at Princeton University. So it seems like teaching about credit would be pretty straightforward. After all, the credit scoring system purports to take the bias out of lending using objective metrics. Um, so if you teach our participants the rules of the game, they should be able to excel, right? To understand inequities in the credit system, it's helpful to look through a lens of disparate impact. Disparate impact occurs when policies, practices, rules, or other systems that appear to be neutral result in a disproportionate impact on a protected group. Take, for example, what we talked about last time. Although access to bank accounts are open to anyone, Black and Latinx households make up a much larger percentage of the unbanked and underbanked populations. And so most of us are familiar with the pie chart de detailing which factors weigh most heavily in credit scoring. Uh, Lisa Rice, President and Chief Executive Officer at the National Fair Housing um, Alliance put forth an analogy that described uh, the, the disproportionate impact that our current scoring model has on communities of color. Um, to quote, uh, basically, Suppose the DMV tests a car driving a driver to determine his or her driving abilities. In this test, the driver must drive through a path and navigate a series of cones and obstacles, but the driver is placed in a car that is essentially a limit. The brakes do not work, it does not turn well, and the transmission malfunctions. The driver knocks over several cones, running into obstacles, and completes the course, receiving a low score. But then the same driver is placed into a different car and asked to drive the same course again. This time the car is not a lemon. It is a pristine condition with no problem. In my kid's mind, it would be a Lambo. Uh, <laughs> the second time through, um, the driver passes with flying colors and receives a high score. Did the driver change? Of course not. What changed is the vehicle the driver used. The test accurately measured how well the driver navigated the course as influenced by the quality of the vehicle, but not his or her driving abilities. Similarly, credit scoring mechanisms are often reflective of the lending environment or the loan product type, but not the risk profile of the borrower. So the financial mainstream fails to properly serve consumers of color who disproportionately access credit in more volatile financial environments. And since the Great Recession of 2008, 93% of all bank closures have been in low-income communities, made up primarily of residents of color. Given that bank services are critical entry points to affordable credit and capital distribution, this trend has contributed to the rise of credit deserts across the United States. So we're going to go through each piece of the pie, starting with the payment history, which makes up 35% of the FICO score. The payment history component of the FICO credit score includes information about whether borrowers make a timely debt payments, including some subprime loans. Subprime loans carry a much higher default and delinquency rates, not necessarily because of the borrower's traits, but instead because of the aspects and features of the loan. A unique study comparing two similar groups of low and moderate income borrowers with similar characteristics demonstrates this point. The divergent variables were the loan terms, conditions, and the channel used to obtain mortgages. While the traits of both borrower groups were for, uh, similar, performance outcomes were not. The default rate for the subprime portfolio were four to five times higher than the lending program portfolio for the low and moderate income borrowers. Moreover, the study revealed that compelling evidence that loan characteristics and origination channel significantly impacts loan performance. Specifically, prepayment penalties, adjustable interest rates, and elevated costs negatively impacted loan performance, even after controlling for credit scores. Additionally, loans originating through broker channels tend to result in higher default rates. So amounts owed 
a FICO score. So the FICO reports, oh, excuse me, carbonation giving me bubbles. FICO reports um, that the amounts owed category takes into consideration the amount of credit available to a borrower for certain types of revolving and installment loan accounts. And to the extent that underdeserved communities have restricted access to credit and the type of credit that loan companies may positively report um, to credit repositories in particular, amounts owed can pose a dis disparate discrimination impact. The lack of access to the mainstream lenders may impact the ability of the underserved consumers to obtain revolving or installment lines of credit. If these borrowers, borrowers experience undue difficulty in accessing quality credit, they may well suffer a lower credit score from a system that considers how much extra credit they may have available in certain revolving and installment accounts. Here again, accounts owed is not only the measuring the ability of the borrower to effectively manage credit accounts, but is also measuring the consumer's access to certain credit accounts. The next slice of the pie is length of credit history, which is 15% of um, the FICO credit score. Um, presumably, the longer a borrower holds an account, and to the extent that the account has been reported to the credit repositories, the higher the borrower's credit score. If this is indeed the case, then borrowers with access to credit that goes unreported to credit repositories will be negatively impacted by this component. Um, we see this because um, all the time, especially in things like housing, like your mortgage payment gets reported, um, but a renter who also makes a housing payment doesn't have their, um, typically have their payment reported as well. This factor penalizes borrowers who deal on a cash basis, access to credit outside of the financial mainstream, um, cannot, if they can't access traditional credit or obtain credit from lenders who do not report positive data. This is um, somewhat of a big, um, I, for me, it is completely unfair, I think, for people to make payments and not have that positively reported, but when they miss payments, um, it's a ding against them. Um, but borrowers with these circumstances are disproportionately persons of color. This means that borrowers of colors will be less likely to have a lengthy credit history. And then with new credit, new credit equates to 10% of the FICA score. So new credit considers the number of accounts a consumer recently opened. So FICA advises consumers to avoid opening new lines of credit because it might result in a lower credit score. Further, opening new accounts lowers the average account age, causing a lower credit score. There are two areas of concern with respect to um, the outcomes under new credit. Um, first, there is a high likelihood that consumers of color will access new credit accounts. Credit access is a major challenge for underserved groups and that these groups are much more likely to be unbanked and underbanked. The second concerning area um, emanates from the higher mortgage loan de declination rates uh, for borrowers of color. Um, so at every income level, Black and Latinx applicants were denied credit at approximately twice the rate of the white population. So let me bring that again. At every income level, Black and Latinx applicants were denied credit at approximately twice the rate of the white population. So given these high uh, declination rates, borrowers of color are likely to apply to several lenders before successfully acquiring a loan. And if a consumer applies for a mortgage with one lender, waits to be declined, and then applies for a mortgage with another lender, this process may well negatively impact the consumer's credit score due to the longer lapse in time between the inquiries. Types of credit used is about 10% of your FICO score. Um, and there's evidence that certain types of credit, such as credit provided by finance companies, 
um, like GMAC, Credit Acceptance Corporation, and One Main Financial are treated less favorably than credit provided by mainstream lenders like depository banking institutions. According to the Federal Reserve Board, many credit scoring models consider the number and type of credit accounts you have. A mix of installment loans and credit cards may improve your score. However, too many finance company accounts or credit cards may hurt your score. This category also presents dangerous implications for borrowers of color. In a guide advising consumers on how to improve their credit score, FICO suggests that they have installment loans and credit cards that are reported to credit repositories. FICO implies that these credit sources will play a favorable role, uh, favorable role in the FICO credit scoring system. But these types of credit may actually penalize consumers who access them outside the financial mainstream. Of course, we do need to teach our participants the rules of the road, but we don't need to pretend that everybody is driving a roadworthy car. Not everybody has a Lambo. Some of us have Pintos. I don't know if that ages me, but trying to make jokes, dad joke status. Um, but we've been focused far too long on the risk characteristics of the consumer and ignoring the quality of the environment or type of loan product to consumer accesses. Um, and something that Luke added from the FNN um, brief is that credit building for people who are excluded from traditional reporting, for instance, renters who have no credit record or who have a negative record um, requires more than establishing a new record of on-time payments it also necessitates understanding the rules, managing debt carefully to maximize credit score impact and avoiding credit repair scams. Um, we're gonna break into small groups in a moment, um, but I wanted to review again the small group um, guidelines. Um, specifically, we're asking that each group has a self-appointed small group conversation leader, can be more than one person. Um, but the guidelines for the volunteer conversation leader is um, to just be a guardrail for the group, try to keep the group on topic. Um, silence is a tool, you don't need to fill space, um, but try to bring forth other ideas in the group. Um, if there are multiple questions, please make sure that they are addressed and um, make sure there's one person in the group, um, in this case, recording your answers and ready, uh, who's also available to share out to the, the larger group. Um, and as a conversation leader, if you're not getting answers, try and rephrase the question in different ways um, so that you people have different ways to think about what the uh, answer might be. And, give people a chance to sit with the question and um, try not to fill space, give people the room to answer. All right. So um, what we're gonna do right now is we're going to paste in the chat a Google document um, and Luke is right now breaking you all up into groups and in the Google document, you'll see um, what group you've been assigned to. And in that, um, there's also a document for your group. So you'll open the document and you'll read the example of a scenario. Um, and as a group, every, everyone in your group will try and answer the non-example, your scenario as a group. Um, so we're going to give you about 15 minutes to go through both the example and what we're suggesting is somebody step up and read the example out loud um, and um, first so that everyone understands what we're what the exercise is and what we're trying to get you all to do. Okay, um, so we will bring you back in 15 minutes. Um, Please make sure you have your answers recorded and have someone ready to report back out. All right, so you got the link in the chat. I didn't get everybody's names into each group, but you'll, I got three people's names in each group. So you got to figure out which group you are. Then in that Google document, you click on your group and that gives you an example. 
your scenario and an example, um, the example is the same for everybody, just to kind of, we wanted to practice this and try it out. And um, so you have that example. So 15 minutes, uh, you can ping me if you're having trouble. Uh, and we'll be back in 15 minutes to report out your uh, example uh, scenario that you work through. Any questions? It's a little confusing, but the document should walk you through it. So we'll see you back in 15 minutes. All right, so I know the group I was in didn't quite have enough time, but there was there was good discussion, I think, to get to the point of trying to name the systemic barriers. And then I heard a lot of things that were like, well, we don't know this about the person. Um, I would say those are questions you ask them, um, that the curiosity is one of the strategies uh, to counter, you know, uh, direct uh solutions for somebody is to be curious so we want to have a little bit of time for each group to share out uh just pretty briefly your your scenario what were some of the values uh goals systemic barriers and if you got to the question to respond to um so i'm going to start with group one um we're going to take a break after this just so you know so uh share out and then we'll take a break and then we will continue on so group one alex daniela and debbie's group uh, can you give us a little summary of what you all, what your scenario was and what solutions um, or responses you came up to to counter the dominant narrative? Yeah, and please, anyone from group one, please state something. But yeah, I mean, it was informative exercise because we had our assumptions and we started off with that. But then I think it was Chantel from our group, you know, saying like, well, maybe we should check in with the client and see what they want. And that kind of was like a, a little bit of a turning point. It is kind of static when you're reading something and not actually engaging because there's no, you know, uh, back and forth. And obviously that's what we would always want with our clients is, is what do they want? What do they want to achieve? But also informing them about different areas that they may be not aware of. And please, uh, other people from group one, please let me know if I, you know, you want to put anything in. Anybody else from group want to add anything? What uh, what systemic barriers did you uh, name? We didn't, I mean, I don't think we named any specific barriers um, at all. It was really just the assumption of we, as people who work with clients, maybe almost jumping to a conclusion to help them and not focusing on their need. And obviously, again, we would be talking to them and find out, so uh, what do they want? But we didn't, I don't think we named any specific one barrier. I, I, I can jump in a little bit. Nice. I remember one person, this is Chantal, but it's someone else, and I forgot their name, sorry, um, mentioned that having a, uh, the credit, history being um, a problem because it was had a they had a thinner file and um that would be a barrier because maybe they just started out or um and that could be one of the questions like what was the hesitation to build the credit if there was one and um so going down that 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 train of thought um i think is where we could sort of thought that would be a a barrier Great, thanks. Yeah, if people, you can click on their example. It's about looking for a rate on a car loan uh, with a thin credit file. And yeah, I would say, you know, a systemic barrier is um, you could just reflect to the client that, boy, you know, they really make it hard to find a, an affordable car loan um, when, you know, the, the payment history is not helping build your credit or something like if we're thinking about the thin credit file being a system that is limiting, right? And uh, not making an assumption that it means that, you know, they're 
uh, bad at managing their money, but that the way that they manage their money isn't reflecting on their credit score, right? Thinking back to the way credit scores are including and excluding uh, certain things. Okay, let's go to uh, group two. Who from group two would be willing to share a little bit? This was Brent and Christie's group. Sorry, I think one of the names got mixed up, but uh, Brent or Christie's group. I'm happy to uh, talk through this. Let me go back to our, uh, our piece here. Um, so we're dealing with Sam who has no credit history and is nervous or worried because he's seen his parents or his family members struggle with debt. Um, and so that dominant narrative response, you should, uh, oh, and he's being offered uh, credit cards from the stores he's going to to get a discount and things like that. Um, that dominant narrative being you should establish credit as soon as possible. Any credit account is better than nothing. Um, we thought it was really interesting restating the client's goal here. I mean, ultimately it's something that we wouldn't recommend and we kind of talked through that as well, but like he wants to remain debt free. So he doesn't struggle with debt. He doesn't want to risk taking out debt that he's not able to pay it off. Our big question with counselors is, okay, well, how are you going to participate in the credit system without incurring some kind of risk? We knew long, you know, we knew down the road that if you ever want a house, likelihood is that you're going to have to engage in the credit system, maybe even a car as well as, just generally other things that might be a little bit easier um, with that. Um, but it was a, a really interesting conversation there. Um, when we looked at the systemic barriers here, um, one was just life experience. I mean, this was maybe personal, um, but we can't imagine that it wouldn't affect others in Sam's community, which is just those life, his life experience includes past familial struggles with credit. Uh, and I can't imagine that that's not, you know, that, that's not prevalent as well, um, just e even in the U.S. as a whole. Um, but also that free and easy access to store credit without any education, without any understanding of what that might actually be. We talked about how those cards are sold. They're sold as a discount getting mechanism, but you don't know anything about how to pay it off or what the interest rate comes with or any of those pieces when you're sold that in the card. So there's a there's a level of, of complexity there as well. If you were to engage in every, if you were to, to apply for every store card that you could get, that's even on its face is just going to be difficult to manage, not notwithstanding the, the difficulty that or the 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 marks against your credit that that might incur as well, uh, as well as just the general lack or trust of financial institutions from his past history. I Great, that, thank you so much. Oh, I just wanted to include one thing real quick. Sorry, my video is off because my internet is poor. Um, I think Sarah did a great job of like circling back to um, that we really don't know anything about this person. Um, their hesitancy to engage in credit building activities um, doesn't reflect anything on their actual money managing capacity. And so, you know, really looking at, you know, digging deeper with them about what are their skills and then helping them to apply the skills to, um, you know, potentially their goals around building credit. Great, thank you. And I heard also just a, an engagement around what are their future goals and do they anticipate needing credit to accomplish those um, as a way to wrestle with the, the, yeah, the place that they're in not wanting it, knowing it's risky, having bad past experience, but also maybe having goals that might require engaging. Uh, group three, uh, would you all report out? Um, this was uh, Diana Gerardo Canali's group. Hi, I'm Leah. I was one of the members of group three. So we um, read about Joe who has unsteady income and mostly uses um, alternative financial products like payday loans and kind of his experience around that. Dominant narrative was your credit needs are best served by mainstream banks. And their goals uh, and values of Joe um, to be able to, to 
pay his expenses, to be respected, to not be judged, um, to meet his financial responsibilities and, and values that can be attached to those things, such as uh, trustworthiness responsi and responsibility. Um, and then in terms of systematic barriers, um, you know, we talked about uh, an unequal access to, so he, he did show um, some knowledge about kind of long-term costs of engaging in those problems, but uh, unequal access of uh, to financial education and different financial services. Um, um, sorry, the, the unsteady income in the first place, which it didn't explain why, but you know, that could have anything to do with discrimination of jobs, different work schedules, different caretaking needs, anything there, um, which are all those. And then the fact that he's not getting his needs met by being, by mainstream banks, um, right? That can be discrimination. That could be um, lack of, of trust between communities. Uh, there's a lot of information we don't have, but that um, the stigma at play about using different um, banks and then presence of things like fees and overdraft charges and uh, potential lack of options and availability of options. And then we didn't get to <laughs> quite around to asking the question. Does anyone else from our group want to add something there? Thank you. Let's close out with the last group, group four. I can go ahead and go. Um, so ours was, uh, the problem was Tina had enough income to get by and has a goal of buying a home in the future. She has one credit card that she uses cautiously, but is worried about how her low income will affect her credit score. Um, and then the dominant narrative was your credit report doesn't have information about your income listed, so your credit score is not impacted by your income. You should use your credit more or open a second card to build your credit score. And um, I think what we you know, were looking at was, um, as far as a restated goal, is focusing around education with credit credit utilization, income, and um, how that all ties into their stated goal of home ownership. Um, we would ask Tina what her values are around home ownership and why that is a goal. Uh, and then discuss um, how income and credit affect affordability as well as discuss strategies and a timeline. So discussing strategies around building credit, how credit utilization works, how it affects scores, um, discuss credit builder loans and create a timeline and plan towards goals. Excellent, thank you everybody for sharing. Um, and thanks for yeah, picking apart uh, these scenarios and thinking about how the intersections with credit um, are at play there. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break. I think at the time, Innovative Changes was unique in the country because um, we really had these sort of three, three leg, legs, three legged stool approach. And one was how do we offer consumer loans? There are lots of CDFIs that do consumer lending, but there were very few at the time who were doing these small dollar consumer loans as an alternative to payday and other predatory loans. Um, there are more and more now. I'm really excited, you know, to, to see the sort of uh, the growth of that, of those types of products um, that are being implemented by CDFIs across the country, because I think to the point that, that we were all making earlier in the conversation um, and in the presentations, having, it's not enough to have, you know, better or bad products. We actually have to have good products out there that, that people can access in order to not just build their credit, but but also you know be, be uh, more financially resilient. So in addition to offering those loan products, Innovative Changes also, um, we set out to offer financial education, you know, uh, along with the loan products. And credit building was this, the third leg of the stool um, that really kind of came as an afterthought initially. Um, as we started researching, 
uh, you know, what was going on. And this was 2008, 2009, before we, we launched the organization, we started researching and, and came across this thing called credit building, which was happening, but was not nearly as commonplace as, as it is today. Um, and, and what we realized was that we, we needed, you know, we needed quickly to, to introduce that as, as a core component of, of the, the program, um, and integrate it with the, the curriculum, um, that we were developing for the, you know, the financial education curriculum that, that really credit building needed to be one of the drivers of that curriculum, not just credit as one sort of component part of a larger curriculum. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we did the, the best job at, of that at that time. I think the organization that I work for now, um, you know, that is what we do. We really put credit building at the center of our approach to working with clients with the caveat that we work with, with clients, you know, on whatever their goals are. And if credit building is not one of them, we don't insist, obviously. But everything we do, we see through the lens of how do we help people build credit histories to be able to leverage the the system. Um, but at Innovative Changes, you know, um, in, in those days, I think the, the concept of credit as an asset um, and, and sort of untethering it to the extent possible, or at least looking at it as the, the other side of, of the same coin from debt was really still very new. So it was still this, this, this idea that, you know, credit equal debt. Um, and, and we were trying to kind of figure out how can we how can we change that narrative a little bit in those days and, and really try to put that at the center of the of the curriculum that that we developed? Um, just just a few more more comments on that. I think you know what we saw was that the credit building component of that work of uh, the work that we did was by far you know the most um, the most I don't want to say popular, but but most of our clients came to us because they wanted credit builder loans, not necessarily because they wanted alternative small dollar consumer loans. Often there was, you know, a combination, but um, but really it was driven by credit building, but the, the desire to build credit. Um, and so, and then we started to see the outcomes, um, which were pretty dramatic and pretty quick relative to more some more traditional, you know, financial uh, capability strategies. Um, and so sort of that, that's when I kind of drank the, the Kool-Aid on, on, on credit building. Um, we, we talk all the time about how, you know, it's expensive to be poor. And I think, I think somebody said this in, in one of our conversations in, in the presentation earlier, but it's, it's expensive to have no credit or to have poor credit, I, I think is, you know, another way to look at it. Um, and the only other thing I, I, I'd add here is, um, you know, at the time, I don't even think the term credit invisible had had been coined. And that's now a term that I think we all use, you know, or is much more um, ubiquitous in our in our field, in our space, in large part because of the research that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has done around credit invisibles. Um, and so, you know, it's it's just it it was something that I think we we built in without actually knowing what we were what we were uh, having having terminology for it. Um, but recognizing that it was an issue. That is such innovative work. And I'm so sorry that, you know, uh, Innovative Changes isn't around anymore, but it sounds like it was a great launching point to the next couple places that you landed. Can you talk to us about how your approach and perspective on credit changed during your time at Credit Builders Alliance and then at uh, Working Credit and NFP? Yeah, um, I mean, I would say first and foremost, I learned a hell of a lot more. Um, you know, I, there's so much, as you guys know, as, as financial coaches and, and counselors, the, there's so much devil in the detail um, when it comes to credit. Um, and and so, you know, I was lucky at Credit Builders Alliance, which Julie mentioned is this national nonprofit. I, 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 could, I know that some, some of your organizations are members of CBA, I recognize some of the names. Um, but, but, you know, um, for so long, we talked about my, the luxury I had at CBA was being able to work more closely and maybe peek under the hood a little bit more with the credit bureaus and the way that they made decisions, which, you know, will not come as any surprise that in many cases was either intentionally, you know, uh, racist or just, you know, um, ill-advised or just, you know, because they didn't have 
you know, they were dealing with their own capacity issues or uninformed, right? And so that was very interesting to me, not that I came to the to the work thinking these are great companies trying to do great things, but it was also very, very interesting for me to see um, to see a little bit more how things worked on that front. And I'll just give you one example. We at, at CBA, um, you know, a lot of the mem- nonprofit uh, members are CDFI loan funds, um, and there's a, a fairly sizable contingent of native CDFIs that many of which were doing credit builder loans as part of their portfolio of lending. And because there is this association in the financial sort of ecosystem uh, with, with tribes and payday loans, the credit bureaus, whenever we our team would work to help get the CDFIs um, essentially certified to be able to report their loans to the credit bureaus so that they could help their um, their clients build credit history. When we would send the application packages on to the credit bureaus, they would just categorically deny um, the, the, the certification. They would not allow them to become data furnishers because A, they didn't understand anything about CDFIs and B, in their minds, they were only equating um, you know, any tribal lending with, you know, there has been some historical connection between payday lenders that, that piggyback off of, of tribes' so, um, sovereignty to be able to sort of evade, you know, federal um, and, and state payday loan laws. But it was an, a perfect example of, you know, this is a this is a good opportunity to help people build credit, you know, for whom, you know, credit is, is elusive and, and, and has been challenging. And, you know, without, without recognizing that, um, that, that, that connection, you would have had this whole group of, 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 you know, great lenders offering great products to, uh, you know, people who really needed those products just not be able to, to participate in the system. Um, so, uh, you know, learning a lot, seeing kind of how it worked, you know, on the other side was, was really interesting. Um, I think, you know, the other thing that, um, that I saw, you know, I saw this at, at Innovative Changes and I see this at Working Credit now is you know what we were talking about earlier around some of the shame, some of the really even despair that many um, participants come to us feeling around credit. I mean, I remember the very first credit coaching session was with a woman who who came in and I pulled her credit report and she burst into tears before she even looked at the before we even had a chance to look at the report, just burst into tears. And so you know we just we sat there, we held hands, we looked at her credit report, and it was it was okay. You know, it wasn't, there were some issues, but it was totally manageable. And so, but, but she came just already being prepared to, to, um, to be, feel really dejected. Um, and we see that also at, um, at working credit. Um, and I think the thing that I've, that that's been helpful at working credit is to be able to name this kind of experience a little bit and put it, you know, in more context, like what you're trying to do with this training, which is really understanding, understanding, you know, the impact of long-standing discrimination in the credit system that's been such a, a structural force for exclusion um, and or for extraction in communities of color in particular. And so our board president at Working Credit is a, a woman named Jacqueline Scott, and I can put some links in the um, in the chat later um, to share some of her her research. She's a race theorist and an associate professor of philosophy at Loyola University. She describes this sort of phenomenon as an existential, is meta oppression. So, so that's you know what her research is about. And meta oppression is defined as an existential um, an existential state for many people of color, particularly American Blacks who have dealt with racialized oppression to such a degree and for so long that it's brought about this um, sort of additional layer of profound sense of resignation um, and despair and a sense that that nothing will ever get better. It won't ever change. And so at Working Credit, we've been able to, you know, in addition to talking about um, structural racism as sort of the, you know, the thing that under, the issue that undergirds everything, putting that framing of meta-oppression at the forefront of our work um, as educators and, and counselors, um, because as practitioners, I think we do have to hold, and we talked about this in the, in the breakout group that we were in, we do have to hold the tension between you know, the failures of this larger system and our 
um, mission to help people leverage it to their advantage because it, it's so critical to wealth creation. So naming it and integrating it into our relationship building with participants has been really helpful as a way to try to interrupt the, the sort of impact of meta oppression, which we, we think you know, ultimately helps interrupt the, the impact of structural racism. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, we are, I'm just looking at time. We don't have that much time. Um, but I also, I'm not seeing any questions pop up. And so if there aren't questions from the group, I'm gonna go ahead and keep going with my questions. But please, if you do have questions for Sarah, go ahead and type them in. Um, so do you see any opportunities for systemic changes in credit reporting and scoring that you would like to share with the group? Yeah, I mean, I think you alluded to some, and just, you know, I put my email in the chat box, so please feel free, you know, if anybody has any questions after this to, to reach out anytime. Um, I, you alluded to this in your, and some of your comments, um, Julie, sort of the idea that um, of alternative, of rent reporting as one source of alternative credit uh, reporting. And, and at CBA, that's sort of near and dear to my heart because when I was at CBA, I worked for like a decade on rent reporting when it first became a thing in, in 2011 to where it is now, which is much, you know, sort of a, an inflection point, I would say, as, as HUD has really kind of embraced it and Fannie and Freddie have embraced it. And so it's it's really becoming more, um, more a reality. Although, again, there are, you know, I don't believe in any silver bullets and, and there are sort of some infrastructure risks that, that are associated with the way that it's implemented or challenges, right, with the way that it's implemented at all, I think ultimately comes down to implementation. But I do think alter some alternative data is, um, is, is, is a good way to, to sort of open up um, opportunities to access, to, to engage with the credit system on, on, your, on consumers' own terms. Um, there's this big push to consumer permission or for consumer permission data. So people probably have seen all the Experian Boost uh, commercials and other things like that. I think that's a, a step in the right direction. But I think ultimately what, what would really make a difference is, is if it was consumer owned data that we're giving permission for, um, for the bureaus and other big kind of aggregators to, to um, or repositories to have access to. Because, you know, I, I, I don't, philosophically necessarily have anything fully, I mean, our data is monetized all the time by so many different, you know, players in, in, in our financial system, but we should get a piece of that pie as consumers as well. Um, so I think that's another big thing um, that could be, that could help break down some of that, those structural barriers. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about um, not replacing the credit bureaus, but having a public credit bureau? I have mixed feelings about it, not because I don't think it could be perfectly fine, but I, I, you know, depending on what administration is in office, I'm not sure I, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the core challenge. I think the core challenge is more who owns my data and do I get some say over how it's used um, and sold, um, I think, and whether that is a, you know, a, a capitalist, you know, monopoly of credit bureaus or whether that's the federal government, again, depending on who's leading the federal government, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the federal government could do a better job um, because I'm not sure that the job, I, I think the whole, the whole construct has to be rethought. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so some practical tips. Do you have any, when it comes to teaching about credit, can you name maybe like your top three best practices? I mean, for just credit building, it, the, the interesting thing is that even though so much has changed in the industry, nothing, it really hasn't changed. You have to have a product that reports to the credit bureaus. You have to pay that, you have to pay on time. And if it's a revolving product, you, you know, you want to keep the balances low, if not completely, you know, not have any balances at all. Um, I think those are like the core, I mean, there's a lot more to it, but, but those are just like the three take, biggest takeaways for if you're working with someone, those are, those are it. Um, but I do think as for practitioners, um, you know, I think really, um, and, and we, we talked about this a little bit too, um, really being intentional about not being judgmental and not and sort of checking our biases and our, our assumptions when we're working with folks. Um, so I think that's a, a big piece of it. And, and in our, you know, in the financial education 
space, that's been a real challenge too. And when, you know, we started with financial literacy um, and moved to financial capability and now, you know, so there's, there's just a lot of, of, of challenge with, I think that, that trust as well. Um, and then I think the other thing just for a pra- best practice for practitioners, and this is really hard, is just trying to stay on top of all the changes um, so that you know what advice you're giving um, and, and how relevant and, and um, accurate it is. Do you have any suggestions of where someone might find that data? Yeah, I mean, not to, you know, toot its horn, um, because obviously I have a vested interest in in Credit Builders Alliance, but I think that's a really good, if your organization isn't a member of of CPA, they've got a a learning or a library of resources and a training institute. They've got really good resources. Change Machine, I don't know if if folks are familiar with them. They um, They have a great kind of um, it's almost like a Facebook network for sharing and learning and a lot of great tools. Um, ironically, the Bureau's sites have gotten pretty good too about, um, there's a lot of good, you know, even if you go to FICO, you know, .com, there's some really good resources there and they will be keeping you up to date on some of the latest and greatest because it's in their interest because they want to, you know, convince people to lenders to use it and, and consumers to buy it. Um, I think also the CFPB has some really great resources. Um, the FTC, you know, especially on like the identity theft and, and disputing side of things. Um, that, that's where I'd start. All right. We have a, a question from Randy. Um, I've seen some CDFIs and lenders only report to one or two credit bureaus, uh, maybe through CBA. Could you speak to why this happens and what are the pros and cons of this? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, part of, if, if they're reporting through CBA, historically, um, it took a while for Equifax to join. So they started with uh, being able to report to Experian and then to TransUnion. And then it just took a while for Equifax to allow CBA to, to help nonprofit lenders report to them. Now you can report to all three. Um, there is, through if you're doing it through CBA, there's not there, there can be additional cost to that. There, there, isn't a, there isn't necessarily a cost to report to, as a data furnisher if you go directly, but certain small nonprofit lenders can't go directly and that's why CBA exists. Um, I, I think at this point in time, it's not, it sort of depends. It's ideal to report to all three because you wanna make sure that, um, that it's showing up on the reports of all three, ideally, but I don't think given the way that, um, given that in many cases, nonprofit lenders are kind of a gateway lender to more mainstream lenders. Once, once folks are, you know, borrowing from a bank or borrowing with, you know, from a traditional credit card, it will get to all three bureaus anyway. So I wouldn't, you know, I don't think it's the, the biggest deal in the world, but it is ideal if you can, as a lender, report to all three. Can I just back up and ask a clarifying question around when you say go directly um, in, in terms of reporting, what does that mean? Like, Yeah, that just means it, as a lender, if you wanna furnish data to your, you know, your loan data to the credit bureaus, you can most, the reason that CBA was created was because there's a, the bureaus all have a certain threshold of okay. the number of loans that lenders have to be making in order to be able to furnish their data directly. And many nonprofits are making way under, you know, the, the number of loans they're making is way under that threshold. So it, so are you saying that um, large lenders, it doesn't actually cost them anything to report um, and only costs to report if you're small, if you have under a certain number of loans? Well, it wouldn't cost you. I mean, there's a, there's a fee associated with CBA service. So if you're going through CBA, it's not it's not astronomical. It's not going to break the bank. Um, but it it you know there are, there are fees and there are fees associated with being a data furnisher in the larger ecosystem. But the, you know the bureaus are they monetize the data once they get they they've got it, and so they just want the data. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm just wondering what the what the barrier is um, for certain lenders not to report and whether or not that was a cost issue or just not the infrastructure. In most cases, it's it's just this it's the size, the threshold number of meeting the threshold number of, of loans um, and, you know, and the complexity of, of becoming a data furnisher. It, there's a lot you have to, you know, comply with the FCRA. There's a lot of other things. And 
in a case like CBA, they're not just helping you, you know, report the loans. They're also, you know, making sure that you're you have policies and procedures in place that are compliant with the FCRA. So that so I think there's complexity, but it's really that threshold number of loans. Okay. All right. Um, our time with Sarah is almost up. We have probably time for one more question if there's one out there. Luke's posted um, a couple of websites that Sarah mentioned and Sarah put her email address on here. She is um, so dedicated to this field of work and so knowledgeable. And I encourage you guys, um, if you have questions to reach out with, um, to her, we really appreciate your time and the effort you took to explain things to us and just all the contributions she made to the field. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I appreciate the invitation to be here. All right. I think next, we're headed into breakout groups. Randy, you want to uh, give us the prompt? Yeah. Um, shout out again to Sarah for all her, her wisdom and perspective and bringing that to the space. And we're going to do breakout groups for the next 10 minutes. Um, and the prompt for this particular breakout is how, if at all, has your approach and perspective on credit changed over time? And we'll post that in the chat and then we'll break you off into groups. So how, if at all, has your approach and perspective changed over time? I'm going to send you all out. We'll be back in 10 minutes. All right, we're just going to wrap up with a few people sharing out if you are willing to about your reflections on that question that we had in the breakout. So anybody want to speak up? I, mean, I, I can go up. We had a good group discussion um, and how, you know, our marginalized communities have been affected most by credit and the reporting. I also feel like there's kind of a stranglehold with these, you know, credit bureaus and FICO and now the advantage uh, that they have too much power and it really disproportionately hurts people um, that primarily we work with and um, that just helping people um, learn about how credit works, um, hopefully over time will will help them uh, and just use it as a resource and not get so hung up on the score and hopefully the trend over time that they'll prove that. Thanks, anybody else? I think um, one way my perspective has changed is like when I was younger, I used to think that credit was like, if you handle your money responsibly, like you're gonna have that great credit score. Um, and I've really realized that it very much so is like playing the game and knowing the rules and kind of falling in line with like what that expectation is um, and that it's not necessarily how responsible you can be really, really responsible with your spending and not have a good credit score, or be credit invisible. Um, so that's something I've really learned. Thank you. Maybe one more. I think my, one of my reflections on this question is just how uh, much more people pay if they have no or low credit score to do the same things that somebody with a good credit score, uh, which really um, is, you know, a, uh, I think a, a reflection of historical inequities and how those carry forward. So just learning about that um is to me something i've reflected on growing that understanding um and and empathy sympathy and empathy for uh the you know if you're stuck in in a situation where you're paying more for uh you know 
somewhat arbitrary reasons sometimes. Um, so just to close out, we wanted to ask if anybody out there um, is a CDFI that offers uh, small dollar uh, loans or credit builder loans, can you put it in the chat? I'm just curious, or if you are referring to somebody, um, because we heard, you know, Innovative Changes in the past has done that. I know there's CDFIs out there uh, in Oregon and some of you on the call. Uh, awesome. MISO Credit Builder Loan, um, Community Lending Works, uh, which is, uh, yeah, an arm of Dev Northwest, I believe. Um, so keep putting those in the chat. We want to just reflect on that activity that you did at the beginning. Um, we know it was really hard because we did it. Randy and Julie and I did that example and we were like, dang, this is hard. Like to really not jump to solutions or assumptions, but to think about what are the systems that are making it harder and uh, to start with that uh, understanding of the person's values and goals um, rather than jumping to the formula of credit, right? Is like 35% this and 30% that uh, before jumping to that really to take time to think about how would we assess values and goals and situation that a person is in and the barriers that they face and it is hard i think the activity was hard because it is hard um so 15 minutes definitely wasn't enough time but could try and practice it uh in the next conversation you have about credit with somebody or uh maybe do a role play with other colleagues if you want to um practice your muscles at at having responses that are centering the person's values and goals and uh, their hopes, not, not your solutions. Um, so that brings us to the end. Uh, Randy posted in the chat the uh, evaluation. We'd love to hear feedback from you all, especially if you haven't yet given us feedback about these sessions, if you've been participating, because we do look it over, figure out how can we make those group conversations more interesting? Uh, what do people getting out of the content, what do they wish they had more of. So please uh, fill out that survey. And um, Randy, do you want to talk just briefly about next steps um, for what are we looking at after this session uh, for the future? Well, as always, we appreciate y'all and being in the space and learning and growing together. Um, again, please complete the survey um, as an opportunity to give us that information um, so we can improve and plan these lessons in a way that helps us all expand our experiences and our ability to serve and center clients. And as far as next steps, uh, looking ahead to next session, um, we'll kind of hit it's uh, at to be to be determined at this point, we're going to look to go ahead in the new year. Um, so we will uh, communicate with you and share some of that information with you. And we'll most likely have an interlude between when the next session happens, that communication um, and this particular session. Um, so yeah, so stay tuned, uh, more information to come. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day, rest of your week. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, everybody.